economics had changed since the 50s and 60s, that in the 50s and 60s, it was still possible to raise a family on one income. And we are reaching the end of the age of exuberance. And real wages have been declining since 1973. And now I know people who have children who have two incomes and they still are having a hard time. That wasn't what things were like in the 50s and 60s. And so there is this mythology that they're supposed to be able to work a job and have some time off, but those days are, are disappearing. Eric, thank you for having me here. It's beautiful. Well, well thank you for setting this up and thank you for coming. Absolutely. Um, you know, in a world with so many labels, everyone watching this video, they're going to want to know, what are you? Who are you? Can I trust you? Right, left. What would you call yourself? Uh, I would say that I'm an environmentalist. I would say that I, I would say that I can sum up all of my, all of my work in one sentence, which is, uh, this way of living won't last forever. And when it's done, I would rather there's more of the natural world left rather than less. I'm somebody who cares about wild nature. And so that's, that's really my entree to all this. We can also talk about, uh, to steal a phrase from Lear Keith, I'm an old growth lefty, by which I mean that I'm a, I, I have, I was at one point a lefty and the left has gone so completely insane that I no longer recognize it. So now I would call myself politically homeless. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess those are, those are two of the ways I would identify. You've been canceled? Um, uh, yeah, I was an... I, I was a semi early adopter of the of getting canceled. Um, <laughs> it's been quite a while now, and it's very interesting because I've written some quite provocative things in my career. Uh, one of my most famous lines is: "Every morning when I wake up, I ask myself whether I should write or blow up a dam." I and, wrote that down in one of my questions. <laughs> it's um, and. I would write strongly against uh, the corporate governing system. I would write strongly against lots of issues and nobody cared. And, um, and then I found out that if you don't believe that men can become women and you don't believe that queer theory is uh, the, the new wonderful religion that is going to guide us all to freedom, then uh, you get canceled. I found, but here's a great example. So I wrote this book in 2001, 2001, 2002, called The Cultural Make-Believe. And one of the things I did that I'm very proud of in that book is I predicted that when economies collapse, the right goes crazy. And... Um, and as a result, that book was long listed for a major literary prize. Mm -hmm. But I missed something in that book. And what I missed was how when the economy collapses, the left goes crazy too, in a complimentary way. And I completely, I didn't mention it all because it didn't occur to me. I didn't understand it. So I tried to fix that. And I wrote that book in 2012. And that book was held by the publisher for five years and then... They put it on their list and then they canceled it and then they severed their relationship with me. So for me, that kind of shows if you have a strong critique of what's wrong with the insane right, that the literary world will reward you. If you have a strong critique of what's gone insane with the, the sort of insane part of the left, then the literary world's going to cancel you. Um, and I want to say one more thing about canceling which is that I've been really upset by this whole round of canceling. And I'm still upset about it, but I've, I've realized that it's not particularly abnormal. We have the McCarthy canceling. We have the French Reign of Terror was a significant canceling. Um, we have, um, you know, all the religious schisms, basically. This is one of the things I've realized that people do is they just try to cancel people they disagree with when they've got power. I'm not saying it's okay. I'm just saying that it's pretty easy for me to look at this most recent round of canceling 
and say, oh gosh, it's terrible. And of course it is, but it's something that happens pretty often, mm -hmm. I think. Um, I mean, you see this in the, you know, early American history with the, the various parties that were forming immediately where we're each trying to shut down the other side's ability to communicate. I mean, that's, that's one reason they put in the First Amendment is because they were both trying to wreck it as much as they could. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm a, I've certainly been, been canceled. Um, and it's, again, it's not even over stuff that you thought was particularly that I thought controversial. Was particularly controversial. <laughs> it's, it's kind of silly that, I mean, again, I've said some, I've said some stuff that like shocks me and nobody cared. All right, so you're a canceled environmentalist who wants to blow up dams. Is what I've got here. All right, well, the send reason, that to the, the press. The, the, now. Thing with the, <laughs> the thing with the the one to blow up dams is what I'm trying to get at with that is that I'm a writer, and writers write things. We we push discourse, but it's not discourse itself that's killing salmon. Mm -hmm. What's killing salmon are actual physical practices, dams industrial logging, industrial fishing, all those things. And so what I'm getting at really with that is the distinction between thought and action and how it's necessary to change discourse to change action, but changing discourse by itself doesn't do anything. It's a, it's a difficult balance too, because I remember when I was younger, I always was like, it has to be action, it has to be action. But you, you actually have to have a cultural understanding of why everyone's taking a certain action. You can't just pressure them into it with force like we try to do or uh, political policy and say everyone has to have this opinion. If people don't really believe it, it's not going to change at every level. So the writing is important for sure. And as I've gotten older, I went a little way from my on the boots on the ground activism, getting me arrested and <laughs> taken away by police and trying to do a little more of writing myself. Um, but one of the main reasons I wanted to talk to you was I've been watching a lot of your YouTube videos, reading a bit of your book, and you, you had a recent video on our modern Malay, our lack of purpose in the modern world. Uh, I, I see it particularly among young people in my generation and younger, but I'm sure uh, every generation is feeling it right now. What, what do you think is at the core of people's lack of purpose in the modern world? When I was in my early 20s, I read a lot of Joseph Campbell. And one of the things he said that really stuck with me was, if a local mythology works for you, you will find meaning. There is a path for meaning readily available for you in the universe, such that if, for example, the rites of Catholicism work for you, there's a couple thousand year tradition that can bring meaning into your life. If the communion means something, if to you, if confession means something to you, if mass means something to you, that can that can that can bring you a sense of purpose, a sense of communion, a sense of community, a sense of meaning. And if it doesn't work for you, then you will undertake what he called the hero journey. You will start to search for meaning somewhere in in life and that meaning is what he called the hero journey that meaning that that quest for meaning is 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 a difficult and arduous process that leads to a form of psychic death i mean that's 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 what happens in the hero journey you know the the hero goes through this perilous thing and comes back transformed. And then you bring back that meaning to your community. You bring back that that gift to your community. And that's not just true for Catholicism, it's true for capitalism. If the signs and symbols of capitalism work for you, then you have a certain set of meaning set up for you. You've got a path you can take if the, you know, if the job working for Acme Corporation and the 2.2 children and the you know picket fence if that all works for you that's great you've got you've got a life set out for you 
The problem is, and Campbell was writing this back in the 40s and 50s, the problem is that increasingly those social means of gaining meaning in your life are increasingly bankrupt or increasingly not working. Forget the word bankrupt. They're just not working for most people. And so we have then a couple, three generations of people who've been raised who, for the most part, don't, the signs and symbols of the old system don't work for them. And at the same time, they don't have the time or the guidance to undergo their own hero journey. So they're stuck in this, in a purgatory, if we can use the Catholic language. They're stuck in this place of, of no meaning because the society is not providing it, nor is society giving them the tools to find it on their own. Hmm. Does that make sense? It does. There's uh, been a lot of videos on TikTok that I was talking to you about earlier where you have young people, particularly Gen Z, talking about how they are so busy trying to get ahead. They can barely afford their apartment. They've got two hour commutes to work. When they do get to work, their whole day is gone. They get home. They're too tired. They go to bed and they're whining online about it. And of course, a lot of people are saying, well, this is what life is. You work or you die. Why are you complaining? This is what man has done since the dawn of time. But I've always felt there's a bit more of a core to their whining. They're crying out because they feel it's for nothing. They're, it's for nothing. And as you said, they don't have the time outside of what they're working for nothing to find the something that they're working for. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that... that... One of the things that politicized me early on, I mean, there, there, there are many sources to my politic politicization, but one of them was I was working at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration when I was in college. My first degree was in physics, and I had a job working as a, as a science assistant there. And my bosses would routinely... If they, if they called in sick for work in the morning, they would show up by noon because they couldn't bear to miss work. They loved it so much. Hmm. And I used to call in sick if it was a nice day. You know, it's like, I'm sick of work. I can't come in. And, <laughs> um, and I realized I didn't want to work a job that I wouldn't come in when I was sick. I didn't want to. We only have one life that we know of. And I didn't want to spend it doing things I didn't want to do. And I had this sort of habit or hobby of asking people if they liked their jobs when I was in high school and college. And about 90% said no. And I was thinking, what does it mean when the vast majority of the people spend the vast majority of their waking hours doing things they don't want to do? That's crazy. I used to go to work, and when I would leave, my dogs would be lying in the sun. And when I would come home from work, my dogs would be lying in the sun. And I'm thinking, we like to talk as though all of evolution existed so that for us, so we can go to work at jobs we don't like. And that's, that's crazy. That's not a way to live a life. You only get, so far as we know, you only get one life. And do you want to spend it doing things you don't want to do? You know, back to Joseph Campbell, he, in his 20s, decided that he was never going to do a thing he didn't want to do. It was his life, and he was going to live it how he wanted. And he can say that because he's not impoverished and living in Mumbai, and he's not a stevedore, and he's not a coal miner in China. Um, and he also didn't have children, so that changed things. But he's got a point. So on, on one hand, the young people have a, a really great point that it is crazy to have a system where the vast where we're killing the planet and the vast majority of people aren't even very happy and so the way i've aimed that when i would teach at a university and when i would i gave a commencement speech at a university before i got canceled and what i kept emphasizing to the graduates is you only get one life and so you got to figure out what you want to do and then do it and um so on, on one hand, I want to say that. On another hand, I want to say that economics have changed since the 50s and 60s. That in the 50s and 60s, it was still possible to raise a family on one income. 
and we are reaching the end of the age of exuberance and real wages have been declining since 1973 and now i know people who have children who have two incomes and they still are having a hard time that wasn't what things were like in the 50s and 60s and so there is this mythology that they're supposed to be able to to work a job and have some time off but with the increasingly globalized automated fast etc cetera, etc cetera, post peak oil um economic system those days are are disappearing and it's really difficult because Again, I'm not going to, this isn't going to be the Joseph Campbell hour, but um, another thing that Joseph Campbell said that really influenced me was that all people of all times have known that to have anything approaching a spiritual life, the first requirement is leisure. Hmm. And that you have to have time to think, you have to have time to, I love the word ruminate, mm -hmm. because ruminate means to to really sort of think upon and it also is what a cow does it eats something and it swallows it and then it brings it back up and it chews it over again and then it swallows it again and it brings it back up and it chews it over and that's that's how i write books that's how i think about anything is i'll i'll I'll, in, I'll take something in and then i'll bring it up and chew on it for a while and then i'll take a walk through a forest i'm chewing on it and then i swallow it back down and wait until tomorrow and bring it back up again for a while. And then eventually, you know, three weeks or three months a year later, I'll have some real, or actually what's more likely to happen is some friend of mine will tell me something. I'll say, no, I disagree. That doesn't make any sense. And then a year later, I'll have this great idea, which is exactly what they said to me a year ago and repeat it back to them. They're like, yeah, I said that to you in a year ago, Derek. Um, but anyway, that's, that's, that takes time and you can't, and one reason that I write so many books is because I spend prodigious amounts of time doing absolutely nothing and just taking walks or I, I love this. I don't remember who it was, but there was some famous poet would put a sign on his door that said poet at work and then he would go take a nap. <laughs> um, and I think I think we we evolve with great long lengths of time in which we would be chatting or so I, I so ask your question again and I'll answer it in one sentence I can't even remember what the question was <laughs> it's all about people uh, feeling malaise. that there wasn't a meaning meaning to any of the work they're doing uh, and there probably the isn't thing. a lot of meaning to the work they're doing I mean that's I'll, that's, I'll give them that mm -hmm. and I think that the oldsters would say that too it's like yeah there wasn't any meaning but where did they gain their meaning? They gained their meaning through their family. And these days you can't even, again, it's very difficult to raise a family on, on those same salaries. So we're being asked to do the same amount of work for nothing without the warmth of family, without the white picket fence, without presuming those work wife, for you, the children. Yeah. Presuming that those, or that those community or the work structure, for you. since they don't have time to have community, whether it be, White and also we're so people. we're so displaced all across the globe mm. that um you know your siblings are a long way long ways away or you know the the people you grew up with are a long ways away i i'm what three states away from where i grew up um mm -hmm. i think that's pretty standard yeah um, have you ever heard of rudyard kipling's poem the god of the copybook headings I read a lot of Kipling when I was in my 20s. The poem um, is essentially, a, he talks about all these different ideas that are so nice and lovely. We don't have to work. We don't have to have weapons. We don't have to have, and then he smacks them down and says, this is nature. This is what life is. If you don't work, you'll die. As surely as fire will burn you, as surely as water will wet, you know? And I think a lot of the, uh, a lot of people might might listen to your ideas and say, oh, there's the lefty in him. He thinks we can just relax and nap like poets, work at the poetry factory, <laughs> and that'll keep in civilization going. But is that really realistic for the average person if they want to survive, or even for a society? Well, you raise a bunch of questions, including civilization, and we'll go there in a minute. But... Um... I think one makes choices 
And um, one of the choices I made was to not have children. And one of the reasons I made that choice is because I knew that if I had children, I wouldn't be able to take decades to learn how to write books because I would have had, I would have had a commitment to, to, I mean, I babysat my nieces enough to know how expensive it is and um, emotionally and financially in every other way. And I think, I think that one needs to make choices. And I remember this is a silly thing, but I remember in college when I was working at NOAA, I used to get a pop every day for lunch. And one day I realized that buying a pop out of the machine every day for lunch would cost me 50 cents a day, I think at the time. And if I didn't drink a pop every day for lunch, I could quit work one half day earlier in the fall and still break even. And it's a stupid little thing, but we, we, we have choices even within the system. The system's going to force us to pay rent, but um, there are very few writers who also... You know, John Steinbeck wrote about this. Is it possible to go out, he asked in a letter to a friend, is it possible to go all out on a novel and still maintain familial relationships? And every choice we make forecloses other choices. And yes, I am saying that one can work at the poetry factory by taking a nap, but there will be costs associated with that. There's a great line about being a writer, which is writing is a great way to make a life and a terrible way to make a living. Mm -hmm. And I sort of embody that in some ways because my, um, my first degree, like I said, was in physics and physics and engineering. And it was from one of the best schools in the world. And, uh, in 1983 dollars, the average salary at that point was 36K for people starting. And 36K in 1983 dollars is probably like 100K now. Mm -hmm. It's So I had, a, I had the opportunity for that. It was like, I chose along the Campbell line. That, that way didn't have meaning for me. So I chose a different way. And that's not to say it's been easy. There have been times I was pouring up, I was collecting cans. You know, it's like, but, and I have to say, it's really easy to be that courageous when at any time you can quit when you have an engineering degree in your pocket and you can quit at any time. There's a difference between collecting cans because your op option is going to, to Walmart to try to get a job and collecting cans because your option is starting at 36 k $1983 the next week. Mm -hmm. So I'm really glad I got the degree. And when people ask me, I always tell them they should keep their options open as much as possible. People say, I want to quit school. Like, nah, man, finish it. And then, and also I, I got out of college with no, um, with no debt. And that's more difficult for people today. A lot of people are indentured servants when they get out because they got 150 K in debt or something. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what I would have done. Well, no, I do know what I would have done. I would have ended up an engineer. There's no way I could have done what I did. So yes, I'm, society can certainly constrain you, but we also have our own choices within, within that. We, we make our choices and then we, we lie in whatever bed we've made. Mm -hmm. You know, I think about that sometimes these days, since, I'm, uh, since now I'm 63, I would have long since retired from being an engineer. It's like, ah, maybe I should have been an engineer. Um, it's, it's, anyway, the point is that I am, and I'm also not ignoring the, the tremendous privilege that I've had to be, to be born where that was even a possibility. I wasn't a stevedore. I wasn't a, a impoverished person in Mumbai. I wasn't one of the, I, I mean, heck, it's, it's given, um, given, what is it, a third of the people or half the people in the world don't have access to electricity. So it's like I could have been born one of them and I never would have had the opportunities to do what I've done. Um, so I'm very aware of that too, mm -hmm. but that doesn't alter the fact that the system itself is not serving individuals well, which is really the point I wanted to get to. The, 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 the system isn't serving individuals well, 
is not serving wild nature well, is not serving our sense of community well. Um, it what it is serving very well is the entire machine culture, which we can discuss or not if you want. Yeah, I think we're going to get to that. Um, I have a few more questions just about the kind of state of the mental state of humanity right now, and then we're certainly going to get to the machine. Um, one of your, you've had a few videos that have gotten particularly popular online lately. I've seen them refreshed on TikTok and Twitter every once in a while. One is your <laughs> Jeopardy for gender theory or something, queer theory. But another one that's gotten a lot of attention, you were talking about young people's mental health issues lately and how a lot of them have suicidal ideation. They want to die when they're going through puberty, becoming teenagers, even a bit older than that. And you say that, of course, young people want to die, but it's supposed to be a metaphorical death and no one tells them that. I'll probably play the clip right now for people watching. And the reason they want to die is because they're teenagers. And when you're a teenager, you're supposed to want to die. But that death is supposed to be metaphorical and spiritual. Your childhood has to die so you can become an adult. But nobody's told them it's metaphorical and spiritual. So they have this death urge that they then actualize in the physical world as opposed to through maturity. You know, this culture is so wretched. So many people are so very, very unhappy. They want this nightmare to end. And they don't recognize that the death that they want is a cultural death and is a spiritual and metaphorical death. Especially because within this culture, the spirit is separated from the earth and from the flesh and so you can't have this transformation that simply occurs in your body could you build on what that idea means for people yeah it, i first came across that when i was um i was interviewing luis rodriguez who wrote gang days in la la vida loca and i asked him why is it that so many gang kids are standing on street corners shooting a mirror image of themselves why, if they're so upset, are they not? Or first off, why are they shooting at anybody? And second, why are they not like shooting at the capitalists? Why are they they aiming this way? And he said it's because they want to die. They're shooting at mirror images because they themselves want to die. And the reason they want to die is because they're teenagers. And teenagers are supposed to die because your child has to die to become an adult. This is the central metaphor of all life is death and rebirth. It's, it's, I mean, that's the story of Jesus is you're supposed to die and then be reborn. And this is the central metaphor of all life. We go through deaths and rebirths constantly. And one of the big ones is that you die as a child to become an adult, but nobody's telling you that that death is supposed to be metaphorical and spiritual. Nobody's telling you that that, um, that that's not supposed to happen in physical reality. So they have this impulse, they have this impulse to kill and to die, but they don't understand that, that, that they're misinterpreting it completely. And the same thing is happening on the larger scale, that this culture is really killing the planet. It's killing everything everywhere. And instead, it just wants for the system to go away. It, it wants for the system itself to die. But we don't understand that. And we don't understand that I mean, part of this comes from having devalued the the spiritual and the metaphorical in the first place. That we don't, we can, oh, that's just a metaphor. That's just spiritual as opposed to, to you know, tangible, tangible things. And there, there is some truth in that, that, that uh, if, if somebody burst into this room right now with a machine gun and started shooting us, I would not want to, I would rather have a gun to shoot back than to, than to appeal to some spiritual assistance to make sure that I don't get killed. You know, there, there is this physical reality that's very important, but that doesn't alter the fact that we are also fundamentally spiritual beings, um, by which I don't mean that we have to be Christian or anything else. I mean that we're, we are that dreams exist for a reason, that there, we have, just the short version is that we shouldn't devalue feelings. They're, they're, see, we're going crazy with all this too, because these days 
lived experience, you know, I feel like I'm a woman, therefore I am. My lived experience is that I'm actually a black woman. My lived experience is that I really, and, and okay, I'm going to back up. Mm -hmm. And the. It's hard to address the question of feelings versus facts right now in a world where you thought we needed to emphasize our feelings more, but then when people are twisting that into absurdities to go against facts when I don't think they need to compete. Exactly. Well, thank you. That, <laughs> you, just, you just saved me from going on for 15 minutes. Um, yeah, that's exactly it, that, that they're, they're complementary and sometimes contradictory, and that's fine too. Um, so I kind of have to have a head of steam. So I want to do the postmodernism thing real quick. Absolutely. Which is that um, postmodernism makes me question whether humans are sentient. Because it is, it starts with a brilliant, brilliant question and answers it as stupidly as possible. And the brilliant question is, when you have multiple perspectives on truth, how do you know what is objectively true and anybody who's ever seen a basketball game or a baseball game knows that you have one person saying he fouled me and the other person is saying no i didn't foul him and the referee decides what's the case or that's what happens in law you have the prosecuting attorney says this guy committed murder the defense attorney says he did not and it's up to the judge and jury to figure out what the truth is and any parent has dealt with the same thing. It's like there's a crash in the other room and the parent goes in and says, how did the lamp break? And the child says, it jumped off the table. Mm -hmm. And the parent has to decide what is true. Socially, the same thing happens. We can argue, you know, Christopher Columbus was a great hero. Christopher Columbus was a slaver and horrible. And what's true? You know, we have these different social narratives. Uh, we can have the same social, we can have different, we can have different social narratives on the use of the A-bomb. Was the use of the A-bomb in Japan a tragedy? Was it an atrocity? Or did it save millions of lives? There's, there's arguments can be made. What's true? And the postmodernists ask that question, how do we know what's true? And then their answer is really stupid. Their answer is that there is no truth, there's only stories. And it, it boggles my mind that people can be that stupid. But that's where we are. Mm -hmm. And that's this all annoys me because there there are critiques to be made for example of science but objective reality not existing isn't one of them and so postmodernism has i think hijacked a very real critique that would need to happen of a belief for example that through science we can eventually know everything um, that's just substituting science for God, you know, an omniscient God. And I think there are critiques to be made of that, but physical reality existing isn't, isn't one of them. So the, 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 the way I try to navigate this is that, is that physical reality is the base upon which everything is built. And there are things in physical reality that are not knowable for multiple reasons, one of which is that reality is not only more complex than we think, it's more complex than we're capable of thinking. So reality is really complex and we only know a little bit of it. Yeah, okay. Just accept that and accept that um, that my I can feel certain things. I can feel like a penguin, but that doesn't make me a penguin. And I don't even know what it feels like to be a penguin. But I can have, what's a better example? Um, all I'm trying to say is that there are things that are beyond our ability to know. And um, one great example is that I started to tell you the story before we went on, on before we went live, that uh, my mom had a 20-year relationship or 15-year relationship with a bear. Um, 
the, the bear would come and sit out here. My mom called her mama. She would come and sit out on the porch and she would bring her babies up every year. And for many, many years, my mom would go on the porch and call, just call for her and she would show up. And then mama disappeared. And that's another thing about living in the real world is sometimes you just don't know, you know, what did, was she dead? Did she move away? We had no idea. And then my mom gets cancer and um, we hadn't seen mama for eight years. And my mom, the week before she entered terminal delirium, she's sitting on the couch right there, looked out the window and mama's on the, on the porch. And so mama, that bear sat there on the porch every day, all day, until my mom entered terminal delirium. And she went away, I haven't seen her since. And the point is that there is, there is more in this world than we can ever imagine. But that doesn't mean that gravity doesn't exist. You know, it doesn't mean that, that, that there is this basis for truth that is physical reality and overlaid or, or, or maybe parallel to that is this other reality of of dreams of of things that are serendipitous and mm. um and they both exist and sometimes they contradict and that's okay do you think you know we're, we were just talking about the idea of young people who want to die but it's really this metaphorical death and this longing people are having this culture this cultural malaise and they don't it like seems... their lives yeah, that too. That is basic. Seems like they're desperate to become something else, both the, the transgender stuff and also just quitting work, whatever it might be. They're desperate to become something else. They're desperate to find something else, something maybe that everything means nothing and that makes them feel better. I'll be a woman, that'll make me feel better. But it almost seems like they actually are longing for that serendipitous, deeper meaning and there's been a separate false reality or narratives in this political sphere that have been created that aren't quite satiating people's desire for that dream world, the connection with nature, the spiritual, historical tradition, Christianity, Familial, whatever it communal. Be, communal, these kind of things. Do you think that's where a lot of the increased mental illness, SSRI use, this kind of stuff is coming from? I think that's where a lot of it's coming from. And I think of one of my favorite lines by R.D. Lang, the psychiatrist, is um, how do you plug a void plugging a void? And what he means by that is if you have a void, you have an emptiness in your life, and you try to plug it with, a, with, a, with another void, mm. it's, it's not going to work. And you will have to keep trying to plug it again and again. So you can be really unhappy and... Mm. You think you can solve it by consumerism. So you go buy stuff. Works for a little while. You think you can solve it with computer games. You know, works for a little while, but it's not going to work. Think you can solve it by making all these other changes, but it's not going to work because yeah. they're not actually solving the, the primal existential problem. They're not actually solving for the right variable. Um, go ahead. Oh, it's just Lear and I were talking about, obviously, a lot of the transgender stuff and you think when you switch genders because you're unhappy with your own well there's a whole swath of problems that men face in their own experience and that women face in their own experience and a lot of those do have to do with whether you can accept yourself and are happy with yourself as you are so i feel like that kind of speaks to the void and void absolutely as well and, and one of the difficulties with all of this is that to work through these things takes time and work. It takes time and effort. And it's much easier to just keep buying something or to just keep, to, to try. There's a great line by Jung about, we will do anything, no matter how absurd, in order to avoid facing our own soul. Mm. And... When I, was, when I was in my early 20s, I had this idea that the more aware you were of, of what's going on around us, the less happy you were. And um, that seemed to be the case with a lot of my fellow students. And 
then somebody asked me, but if, if more awareness means less happiness, why do you want to be more aware? And I didn't really have an answer at the time until a few nights later, I had a dream in which I was driving down a road and there were these, I saw these cranes off to the side, birds, not construction things. I saw these cranes off to the side, flying and then crashing and flying and crashing. And I stopped the car and I got out and I looked at them. I said, that looks like it hurts. Why are you doing it? And they said, we may not fly very well yet, but at least we aren't walking. And I woke up and the, the, the thing was answered for me, which is that that process of going on the hero journey is really painful and difficult. But once you get done, life's a lot better. And another way to think about that is, you know, I had all these symptoms from childhood abuse, uh, just night terrors, nightmares, multiple times a night, just, uh, you know, terrible startle response, all sorts of symptoms of PTSD. And then I wrote a language older than words. And the symptoms after about six months after having finished the book, the symptoms were much, much better because the story had been made meaning of. There was the the, the symptom, I, I, I look at, at the symptoms of the PTSD were trying to tell the trauma story. They were trying to tell, they were reminding me all the time of this is something, I mean, it's like you have a rock in your shoe and it hurts every time you step. This is, this is reminding me that something's wrong and I need to address it. I need to, I can't just go on with life without, without dealing with this in some way. The, that, that's the good news is that it, it resolved. I still have some symptoms, but I'm much, much better starting about six months after the book was over. The bad news is that when I was writing the book, the symptoms became infinitely worse. Mm. <laughs> and that that process was horrific. I wrote the entire book completely sleep deprived because the night terrors were so bad, I couldn't get to sleep until about six or seven every morning. And then I would basically just drift for a couple of three hours and give up and get up and get to work. And nobody is saying that that journey to try to find who you are is easy. And that's one of the reasons that most people don't do it. And that's one reason that, see, okay, so what I said earlier about, about a lot of these kids shooting at mirror images, that was because they want to die. That's part of the story. Another part of the story that's really important is I think a lot of them have a lot of unmetabolized trauma and they're trying to tell the trauma story in some way of what happened to them, but they don't have a, a great example of this is I had a student when I, I taught at a maximum a supermax prison for a couple of years. And one of my students there had, um, I didn't look up what most of my students did, but one day class got canceled and my, my, my supervisor said, I'm going to teach you how to look at the records. So let's look at some students court case. So I did. And this particular student, every story he wrote was about a little boy being sexually abused. And before he would write the story, he would say, this didn't happen to me. This is all fiction. And then he'd read it, beads of sweater coming out on his forehead. He'd read the thing about the horrible effects that the sexual abuse had on the kid. And then he would get done and he'd say, well, it's a good thing that story is fiction because that never happened to me. Mm -hmm. And then we looked up what he did and he had sexually assaulted a woman in a very strange circumstance that was, I'm not diminishing the harm to her, which was very, I mean, it was very painful what she went through, but basically he was, he wasn't using a penis or anything to rape her. He was like playing doctor and it, it didn't, none of it made any sense to me. And then at the end of it, he, she said to her, she said to him, can I go home and wash up? And he said, yeah, you can go home. Just don't call the police and, and you got to come back afterwards. She went home and called the police, of course. Mm -hmm. They arrest the guy right away. The point of all this story is that none of this made any sense to me. It's like, why is he doing I mean, he's a 25-year-old guy who was... And I talked to a friend of mine who's a psychologist. He said, look, if he were five years old and in daycare and he was doing this, what would you think? I said, I would think he was acting out the trauma story. I said, well, do you think he's been abused? He's like, well, every one of his stories... So he was acting out the trauma story. This is not to say he shouldn't be in prison. I'm not saying any of that. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is that if we have unmetabolized trauma, we will often act on it. 
we will act in ways that otherwise don't make a lot of sense. And it takes a lot of time and effort to plug that void for real instead of plugging it with another void, plugging it with meth, with meth plugging it with cocaine, plugging it with heroin, plugging it with TV. You know, there's, I'm not saying that though, that, that short-term solutions can't be necessary. I'm just saying that it's a void plugging a void. And that's another reason that we have all this malaise. There's nobody talking about, see, at one point that would have been a useful function of a church. I mean, that you have counselors, you have people you can go talk to if you're having a spiritual trouble. And, you know, one hopes that in a functioning church that they would actually do you some good. Um, but where are people supposed to turn at this point? Dr. Phil? I mean... <laughs> to the internet, to, to, mm -hmm. to Reddit. And unfortunately that's where a lot of people are going is to the internet for a bunch of people who are just as sad as they are and haven't worked through their stuff. It's crazy listening to that. Cause once again, I would have been like, oh, this is just woo -woo nonsense until I, when I, uh, I got, divorced, separated from my husband. And it was very, the whole thing was very traumatic for me. And I just didn't know how to talk about it, especially because it destroys your public image too. Like, oh, you've had a failed relationship, right? While I was writing how I'm going to tell people, oh, I've been a failure. I started going gray. I'm in my twenties. I started getting gray hair uh, on the sides of my head. And it wasn't until I published the piece that I stopped, stopped graying, anxiety, completely gone. It's like I could breathe again after years of not being able to. And it's it's so difficult to explain that because there is just the reaction of, well, you need to get over it. You can't just sit and whine and whinge all day. You have to get over it. But where do people go? Where do people go? They, they don't have the churches. They don't have the community. People aren't living near their families to talk. So they are crying on TikTok. They are going on the internet and whining. And I guess that was actually leads into my next question of... Uh, what do you think about our inter interactions with technology today? You know, we're we're combining ourselves more with computers than ever before. Uh, we can say we're making computers more human-like with AI, but I think we're becoming a little more computer-like in our own way as well. Um, Apple Vision, Neuralink, where is this all headed? I think we have a... Well, I think I want to go back to the great chain of being. And the great chain of being is this idea that came out of the Greek philosophers that you have a chain of perfection. And at the top of this chain of perfection is God, who is completely disembodied. And then you have angels, and then you have humans, men above women, because men are more intellectual and women are more embodied. And I am not saying that. I'm saying they're saying that. Mm -hmm. And then you have non-human animals and then you have plants and then you have uh soil you have you have precious stones and then soil and the top is pure disembodied mind and the bottom is pure matter with no mind and humans are a battleground i just saw yesterday some guy saying the humans are really great. It's just that our ape genes are making us kill the planet. And I responded to him by saying, funny, I don't see mountain gorillas killing the planet, so I'm not sure it's in the ape genes. Anyway, the point is that this still holds sway today, that we have this idea that there is, I mean, if, if I say the tree told me this, a lot of people are going to think I'm crazy because trees can't speak. Trees can't, uh, don't have any sense of being. Trees... I mean, that's only higher animals. It's higher on the great chain of being. Let's leave aside for a moment. Well, we won't leave it aside because I'm going to say it. But, you know, you know trees communicate, right? This, this, isn't, this isn't cosmic weirdo stuff. There's actually this guy, Stefano Mancuso, a uh, scientist in Italy who has a, made a dictionary, basically, of I think 1,500 terms that, that various plants use. And they're, they're chemical terms. They don't speak with vocal cords, but they send off chemicals. Mm -hmm. And they send off chemicals saying, 
Uh, I'm getting eaten by aphids. Can some ladybugs come and help? And they send notes to their neighbors, not notes, they send chemical messages to their neighbors saying, you need to change your composition because there's a whole bunch of caterpillars coming and make it so they don't want to eat you. So they're mm -hmm. actually, this is this is not woo-woo. This, mm -hmm. th this is measurable stuff in a laboratory. So it's pretty fast. The point though is that it's still hard for people to suppress a smile when you say the tree talks because <laughs> because that we still have this idea that mind is perfect, body is 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 awful, and body doesn't think. Mind thinks, body doesn't. And and humans are this weird battleground, and then everybody below us, dogs don't think, bears don't think, aphids sure don't think, plants really don't think. So anyway, this is all just infected us. And the, the point here having to do with, with computers is that these days, when we're more of a secular world, we don't have God on top, but what's on top is machines. And what's on top is pure disembodied thought as manifested by AI, etc. That is perfectible. That is... So we've just... What we've done is we've taken that same great chain of being and we've brought it forward. This also is central to transgender ideology because... What's important is not my body. My mind thinks I'm a woman. Therefore, I am a woman because what's important is the mind. What's important is not the body. The body is horrible. The body is this vessel that is going to betray me in the end when I die. And so my point having to do with, with all this internet stuff is it's all, again, disembodied. And it's all... It's not a relationship. It's I, 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 and I'm not, I'm not one of those people who never plays computer games. Um, I mean, I, I play them too, and I recognize that I, I had a friend who used to play a computer game, play computer games all the time, and we would be hanging out, and then he'd say, "Well, I'm going to go home and kill some pixels," and he would at least recognize that you're not actually doing anything. It would crack me up. The game he used to play was Lord of the Rings Online. And Very one of the fun. things, what? <laughs> Very fun. <laughs> oh, I, I played it for years. But it, it would crack me up because one of the things he would he was really proud of was the fact he was a farmer and he was going to go plant some potatoes. And it's like, Michael, you're not actually, if I'm going to plant some potatoes, I want to eat them. <laughs> and <clears throat> it just, so so you're not, when you're in a computer game, you're not actually doing anything. And, you know, I was mentioning this before, but, but I, um, I did a talk in LA, and after the talk, uh, people could could have dinner. Uh, there was me, Vandana Shiva, and another person. And after dinner, people could pay to pay Vandana Shiva's organization to have dinner with us. And and somebody sat down next to me, and she looked familiar, but I didn't recognize her. And then she said her name, and she's a she's a famous actress, and said she wanted to sit next to me because I'd been going after patriarchy in my talk. And she immediately said how much she doesn't like porn. And she said she'd been dating. She had dated several guys that she had to break up with them because they wouldn't stop using porn when they're in a relationship with her. And she's on everybody's list of like top, you know, 50 most beautiful women in the world. And I'm thinking as, as she's saying all this to me, I'm thinking, so these men are in bed with, you know, the, the top you know for you know let's ignore the whole male gaze thing and the whole thing about women being judged by their beauty and just go with it for a second and you know she won the genetic lottery on that and she's on everybody's list she's talented she's smart she's rich and the guy she's with still won't stop looking at images of other women naked when they're with her when she asks them to it's like that just this seems completely nuts to me and I couldn't get it, except when I put it in this framework of, well, one of the things that happened is I was talking to my sister about it. My sister's like, Derek, you're misunderstanding this completely. They're not, the reason that they like the women, the pictures of women is because they're not in a relationship. Because she, they don't talk back. They're not real women. They're not flesh and blood who actually disagree with you once in a while. Mm -hmm. They're these images on which onto which you can project whatever fantasies you want they don't want a relationship with a woman what they want is this surface and that's all you get from the internet is surface mm. you can't get 
um, there is no relationship on the internet. There's no, there's no embodied relationship. Let me put it that way. And we have abstracted ourselves completely away from the body yet again on, 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 on the internet. And it's, that's another reason for this, this discomfiture we're all feeling is we're embodied creatures. We, we evolved. It's another part of this that I know this is going a different direction, but another part of this I think is really important is that I want for people to think about the source of everything they perceive. Is it created and or mediated by humans or does it come directly from a non-human? Mm -hmm. And almost all of us, almost every one of our perceptions at every moment was either created by or mediated by humans. And John Livingston wrote about how, or yeah, wrote and talked about how we think of cities as places of sensory overload, and they are in a sense, but they're also places where every single perception is, again, created or mediated by human being. And he thinks that that's an echo chamber. What happens to people who are living in echo chambers? They go crazy. Mm. And we he believes that most of our ideologies are manifestations of this insanity. And you can see that where people talk about, oh, the economy has to grow without recognizing that without a planet, you don't have an economy at all. And that, um, so my point here is that with the internet, again, everything's created by humans and everything's created by technological humans. Everything's created by a certain set of technological humans who have the power to magnify their voices and that's not what we get you know when you when you when you walk through a forest there are all these other voices and when you walk through a human community there are all these other voices too and that's one reason it can end up being so easy to end up in this disembodied echo chamber in in the internet. I'm not specifically talking about the left. It's right. It's this is this is fundamental to the technology itself. Mm -hmm. Um I mean, think about even if you're in a loving relationship, if you're in a loving relationship and you are sorry to get too graphic, but if you're in a loving relationship and you are sexting with your lover, what you're still doing is you're still typing with one hand and masturbating with the other. You're not actually I mean, you're you're you're, you're co-creating a story, but you're not actually mm -hmm. physically together, and we we can forget that. We can forget. I mean, that's the function of a movie is to get you to identify with the characters, and. You know, I was just I was just watching last night. I was watching uh, the last episode of Reacher for this year, and at one point he's hanging from a helicopter, and like, oh my God, is he going to fall? There's a mattress three feet under him. You know, it's like, and and of course he's not going to fall because he's Reacher, and this is Reacher can't die in the in the Reacher mm -hmm. series, but still, I was like, what's going to happen? And that's because we get sucked in, and it's the same with with the internet. We can forget that it's not real. We can forget that there's nothing, there's no there there. And this is really common. This is way before your time, way before everybody in the audience's time, but this is such a great example. Marcus Welby, MD, was a TV show in the 70s starring Robert Young as this wonderful, nice doctor. It's a TV show, that's all anybody has to care about. And NBC or whatever company did him would receive, I think, 70,000 letters a year asking for medical advice. <laughs> And this is not because people are generically stupid. It's because we fall into, we forget what's real. It is so easy for us to forget what's real. Mm -hmm. And the internet's not real. And um, and TV is not real. And, um, and we move from, oh, another thing I want to bring up to all this is that, is the society the spectacle? And this is a, this is a really important concept. 
I was introduced to the Society of the Spectacle reading a really good book called And the Band Played On uh, by Randy Schiltz. It's about the AIDS crisis in San Francisco. And the, the title of the book is that as the AIDS crisis in the 80s was exploding and the band played on was both about the government ignoring what's going on and about the gay community in San Francisco ignoring what's going on. So, for example, some governmental leaders tried to uh, curtail some bathhouse use and the homosexuals were like, the, the, the gays in San Francisco were like, not happening. We're not going back in the closet, which is what you're trying to do. And there were a lot of gays at the time were saying, this is crazy. This is, this is killing us. We need to. And Randy Schiltz is saying that the gay band was playing on, the government band was playing on. Everybody's ignoring that lots of people are dying. Anyway, Randy Schiltz also participated himself in the, in the, the bathhouse culture. And one of the things he talks about, and this is going to be a bit graphic, but he sees, he sees somebody, an amputee who is rubbing his stump against somebody's behind in a, in a bathhouse. He's like, well, that's weird. And then he realizes he's not an amputee, that the guy actually has his entire arm with the other guy's behind. And he, he then thinks, and this is where the science spectrum comes in, which is a brilliant analysis. He's like, how did we come to a place where that would happen? Where somebody, and his answer has to do with the society of spe spectacle. Guy Debord in the 60s wrote about how if you take away relationship, the spectacle itself becomes boring. So what Randy Schultz was talking about is if you take emotion away from sex, if you take any connection whatsoever away from sex, it frankly can get kind of boring. And if it gets boring like that, you have to continue to increase the stimulus to make it so it doesn't get boring. And let's take it away from sex now and take it to anything that at one point it was enough to watch a football game. And then you got to have the Jumbotron. Mm -hmm. And then you got to have the halftime show. And then you got to have, and it doesn't matter what it is. This is just one of the things that happens. This is why pornography escalates so often that it gets boring to see, you know, just this naked woman in a field of daisies. And then you've got to see a gynecological shot. And then you've got to see something else. It just keeps because there's no there there, because you're pl plugging a void, plugging a void, mm -hmm. because it doesn't solve, it doesn't solve your loneliness. It doesn't solve your other problems. And that's the same with the internet in general, is that it has to get more and more extreme. And I think discourse has to get more and more extreme because there's no there there. I mean, you can, you can, okay, so let's say you say something that really annoys me. I can just go, wow, I disagree with that. That. And it kind of, frankly, kind of annoys me. Then, you know, in person, we can sort of hash it out. But that's not, it's much easier online to make some, you know, so you say something annoys me, and I say, well, you're an effing retard. And I win the point, but like, kill the relationship. Mm -hmm. um, but there was no there there to begin with. There was no there there to begin with. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's a line I have in one of my books. Um, something or another is fragile as a Facebook friendship. Mm. And um, yeah, I mean, there's no there there. And anyway, so I wanted to bring this aside the spectacle. That's one of the problems, too, is that stuff keeps happening to get more, more extreme. And you see how this ties back into the, the void plugging a void, that, that if you're not attending to your primary problems of lack of community, lack of um, not having dealt with whatever trauma issues you have, not having the time, and probably having a job you hate. I mean, it's, it's like, those are all things to consider. Those are all things that really need to be. And by the way, when I talk about people having jobs I hate, I'm also not recommending that people simply parasitize off the system. Mm -hmm. So when young people, 15 to 25, ask me what they should do, what they should do with their lives, I always say that your job from like 15 to 30 is to figure out what you want to do with the rest of your life and to figure out what it is that 
you love doing and what it is, what are the gifts that you have and how can you use them in the service of your community and how can you use them in the service of the land base and how can you, it's like, I'm fortunate in that, no, I'm not fortunate. I worked hard for it too, but I love writing and I love, I love writing books. I, I don't love writing press releases. I know people who are really good at that. It's on me. And so I was, I was fortunate or I, well, I, I love this phrase that was on the locker room wall when I was in college, which is luck is where preparation meets opportunity. And I worked really hard and then got the opportunity to write, but I worked really hard. Joseph Campbell said that he spent his twenties learning how to write. So when he got to be in his thirties and had something to say, he would not say it. And I sort of did the same thing. I spent my 20s writing lots of terrible stuff and getting better at it. So the point is that when young people come to me, I always say, you know, I don't know what you love. I don't know what you're good at. I don't know what you get off on doing. And so your job from 15 to 30 is to figure out what you love, what are your gifts, what you get off on doing. It's like I was working with this guy to try to protect some land. He's a wetland specialist. And we're out one day, he's digging in the soil and rubbing it between his fingertips and then comparing the color of the soil to a chart that can tell if it's wetland soil. And I say to him, so do you enjoy doing this? He's like, oh yeah, this is my second favorite thing to do after playing with my dogs. And I'm like, that's great because I would hate this. Because I. I would have absolutely no interest in doing his job. And in that same deal, I was working with this lawyer and she gave us a really cheap deal on helping us in exchange for me writing a lot of the stuff for her. So I had to write a bunch of legal stuff. It was horrible. I hated it. And I said the same thing to her. It's like, do you like writing this crap? It's like, I love writing this stuff. And it's like, that's part of what you're supposed to do between 15 and 30 is figure out what it is that you, that you really love doing. You know, I, I, I talked earlier about getting a degree in science and engineering, and I made a mistake in college. I'm, I'm happy with the life I've lived, but I emphasized physics. I didn't like physics so much. If I would have emphasized civil engineering, I actually thought that was kind of fun. And if I would have gotten a degree in that instead of physics, maybe I would have just stayed. Because I, I, could, I could have seen a life I mean, politically, it would have been horrible. I would have been building bridges instead of dreaming about blowing them up. But, um, but it would have, but but it was still a kind of a the whole sort of bridge design thing seems kind of fun to me. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, young people. Another thing is just remember it's your life and it's not somebody else's life. That you're the one who has to pay for it. You're the one who has to. If you get into this life, what was it? Babbitt. It's one of the books by. Sinclair Lewis. Upton Sinclair, I always get those two confused. Who wrote The Jungle? Upton Sinclair. Sinclair Lewis. Sinclair Lewis and Babbitt had this great line near the end where this character says, in my whole life, I never did a single thing I wanted to do. Like, well, that's a tragedy. So anyway, your job is, as young people is to figure out what it is you want to do with the rest of your life. And then do it. Don't be, I mean, I am in no way suggesting laziness or slaw. I'm suggesting find find the scent, you know, be like a bloodhound, find the scent of what it is you love and then just follow it ruthlessly and follow it mm -hmm. until you until you fall over exhausted. Joyfully exhausted. Yeah, I was just thinking back to um what you were talking about about that the battle between mind and body. And when people are trying to find the things they love, I think another reason a lot of people hate their jobs now is so many of them only demand, only demand mind. And then the other thought uh, I was considering was the idea of SSRIs and how we're trying to find all these different drugs to fix our body rather than just being embodied. I started going to the gym recently and it's improved my mood so much, like to incredible levels. Um, and I told people online, I'm like, you should try this instead of going on drugs. They got very upset. And I think it's that connection to the 
well, no, I don't need to have any connection to my body. In fact, I'm so much smarter than my body. I can invent a drug that I just have to take so that I can only focus on my mind all day and never even have to go to the gym or go outside. <laughs> but um, I, I have to finally get into the last few questions here. Otherwise, uh, we're going to be, it's going to be dark out. Well, I want to say one thing. Like... I want to say one thing about that, which is mm. that um, as well as being a writer, I have in my life been a beekeeper and a commercial beekeeper. And also, um, I grew pot for many years. Mm -hmm. And the point is, those are physical activities. And I uh, have been absolutely, uh, uh, yeah, that's absolutely part of my work is to also have been doing physical activity. I still do physical activity quite a lot. Um, and not, it's just I enjoy moving. Mm -hmm. Besides which, what I do as a writer is sit on my butt, you know? It's like I'm, I'm essentially doing nothing. Just sit there for three minutes and then type for five words and then sit there for three minutes. So it's actually great to move and to yeah. take lots of walks. Yeah. Keeps your mind fresh, <laughs> alive. Well, keeps my body alive, too. Yeah. Um, all right, I swear I'm not trying to get you in trouble here, but... <laughs> what do you think of Ted Kaczynski and his quote, technology and its consequences have been a disaster for the human race? Would you agree? Oh, I completely agree with that. Mm -hmm. um, it's... So we really need to talk about Mumford. And Lewis Mumford, uh, I think one of the most important philosophers of the 20th century. And he was a pro-technology philosopher until World War II when he saw, like... I don't think I like the direction this is going. And he had the courage to sort of change his mind then and publicly go a different direction. And Lewis Mumford's really important because he talks about, we talk about technology, and he broke it down into two types, really, democratic and authoritarian. Mm. Technologies don't arise from and give rise to a vacuum. They emerge from a certain mindset, and they lead to a certain mindset. Before we go any further, think about this. Think about... Think about what a car does to how you think about distance. That if I go to the grocery store and I forget to buy soap, there's no big deal. The grocery store is two miles away. I just get back in the car and drive. If I were walking and I get back and I didn't get soap, it's like it's a two-mile walk. It's two miles each way. It's four miles. It's going to be a couple of hours. It's a drag. And, or the notion of you know you being in Canada yesterday and today you're in California that the ability to travel changes how we perceive that mm -hmm. okay so democratic and authoritarian techniques a democratic technic a technic is the t-e-c-h-n-i-c -E a technic is the uh, social system that surrounds the technology and a democratic technique would be one that arises from and gives rise to democratic decision-making processes. An authoritarian technique would be one that give ri gives rise to authoritarian power systems. And a couple easy ways to think about this are if the thing itself is something you could make, then it's probably democratic, like basket weaving. Nobody can control your access to sedges or rushes or grasses you can you can get them and you can make it you can make a bad basket but you can still make a basket on the other hand anything requiring mining is going to require an authoritarian system because you need to have people to work the mines you have to take the land from people for the mines you have to then have a police system to protect the ore from people who want to steal it you have to have a transportation system to move it you have to have a police and military system to protect it all the way. Mm -hmm. So those all come with the technologies. And a way to, th I know this is like, yeah, whatever. But a way to think about this, I was doing an interview. This guy was interviewing me 10 years ago. And he was a dedicated Marxist who believed that it was possible to have an industrial system with no, with, with only voluntary exchanges. Nobody's getting exploited. Mm -hmm. And you do that by just paying people more and more for the jobs that nobody wants to do. And I said, great, so do you have cities? And he said, yes. I said, great, so in your city, do you have, how do you get around? He said, buses. 
I said, great, what are your buses made of? He said, metal. I said, great, where do you get the metal? He said, we get the metal from mines. I said, how do you get people to work in mines? He said, you pay them a lot. I said, well, mining is such a horrible way to live that um, the, it's one of the first forms of human slavery, but I'm going to give it to you. You can just pay them a whole lot to live underground, whatever. But every hard rock mine on the planet pollutes groundwater, every single one. So what do you do about the people who live next to the river, right next to the mine? He said, you pay them to leave. I said, what if they won't leave? He said, you pay them more. I said, what if they've been living there for 5,000 years, their ancestors are buried there, and they refuse to leave? He said, well, how many of them are there? I said, I don't know, 500. He said, well, the people in the city vote, and the million people vote that those 500 people have to leave, and then you kick them off. And I said, ah, so what you've done is you've gone from completely voluntary exchanges to democratic empire, theft of land from indigenous people, and maybe genocide, also you can have a bus. And the point is that all of that is required to have the mining system. So technology brings great things to us. It makes it so you can fly down here. It makes it so we can have all these cameras. It makes it so we can have uh, hot showers, which is one of the best things in the world. It makes it so we can have all these nice technologies, but they all come with costs. And the costs are not only ecological, but they're also social. And so not only do we have a certain type of power system required, certain type of social system required to run the whole system, which is why, by the way, a lot of anarchists are completely naive because they'll talk about having a city with no authoritarian power structures. You can't, because who's going to collect the garbage? Who's going? You have to have a bureaucracy to do those things. And you have to have a military to steal resources from the countryside. That's all necessary. It's all inherent in the system. We can talk about it if you want. But the point having to do with, with, with the, the Ted Kaczynski quote is that... Um, Yes, it has created, um, Lewis Mumford asked why we don't, why we have not more strongly fought this authoritarian system, the democratic authoritarian system is what he called it, um, that is killing the planet and taking away our freedoms. It's forcing us to work these jobs we don't like. Why do we do this? Why do we put up with this system where the vast majority of people spend the vast majority of their waking hours doing things they don't want to do? And he says it's because of what he calls the magnificent bribe, which is in exchange for us being given luxuries that would have been not dreamed of by any Roman emperor, by any king 150 years ago, we have instantaneous travel, instantaneous communication. We have uh, the ability to so how many million people can watch the Super Bowl tomorrow. We have uh, entertainment. We have eight bazillion channels of entertainment entertainment should be put in quotes probably mm -hmm. um we have all of these things we have refrigeration we have modern medical systems and it's all of these wonderful things are being brought to us at the expense of what we have to do is accept what the system gives us and not expect anything it doesn't give us so we have to give up everything else in the world except for what the system gives us in order to that's the deal we make, is that I will accept these medicines that have kept me alive. I will accept the fact that I could watch TV last night, the fact that you could fly down here, the fact that um, I've got nice food in the refrigerator and in the freezer. We accept all of those in exchange for, you mentioned before the, uh, the cameras were rolling that you have seen uh, so many fish in a stream that the stream is black with them yeah. and I've never seen that and I never will um, that's how it was here I live 40 feet 50 feet from a salmon bearing stream and I see one salmon every long while they're, they're gone and that's the exchange the exchange we've made is all these wonderful luxuries in exchange for no wildness when when prior to conquest if you live near a body of water you would see a grizzly bear every 15 minutes in California. And I haven't been a grizzly bear in 110 years. And um, 
that's what we give up. We give up that. We also give up the fact that we have to work for the machine our entire lives. We have to pay rent. We have to we have to live within the system. If we accept all that, we get all the goodies. That's the bribe we're given. And it's a brilliant bribe. Mumford talks about how the half-baked authoritarian systems of the past would require on basically beating people down. And what they didn't get is you've got to share the goodies with the majority of people, with enough of the people, that enough of the people will buy into your authoritarian system. You can do anything you want to them. Yeah. In exchange for in exchange for this, so one of the ways I put this in my work is if space aliens had come down from outer space and they were doing to the planet and to us, if they were putting, we're putting. I can't remember who her name is, but there was this uh, toxicologist back in the '90s who was writing about endocrine disruptors all just all over the planet, and she's talking about how she didn't understand why. People weren't running down the street screaming because there's flame retardant and all sorts of other carcinogens in mother's breast milk. Mm -hmm. And when you are messing at that level, and I mean, of course, Mumford has the answer. And the answer is because we got a lot of goodies in our refrigerator. And because, you know, the way Daniel Quinn put this is that the problem is we are dependent for our very lives on the system that's killing the planet. And it has inserted itself between us and the source of life, which is the planet itself. And that's why we put up with all of this. So, so I'm gonna back up a little bit again. And um, there was in the 1830s, a pro-slavery philosopher wrote to his Northern abolitionist buddy as to the land ownership conditions in which it's, it's in the land ownership, it's, it's, it's in the landowners that the, the, the capitalist interest to own slaves or not own slaves. It's pretty simple. Slavery was not that profitable. And he said, if you have a lot of land and not many people, then the only way you can get people to work for you is the point of a gun. Because if you have a lot of land and not many people, people have access to land, which means they have access to self-sufficiency. They have access to food, clothing, and shelter. If you have a lot of people and not much land, like in Chicago, New York City, then people don't have access to land, which means they don't have access to food, clothing, and shelter, which means they don't have access to self-sufficiency, which means they have to go to work for you at the point of a gun. And I'm sorry, they, which, which means that they don't, you don't have to have a point of gun. I said that backwards, which means in a city, they have to go to work for you for whatever pittance you want to offer them. So the point is that if your experience is that your food comes from a tap and your, I'm sorry, your water comes from a tap and your food comes from the grocery store, you'll defend to the death the system that brings those to you because your life depends on it. And simultaneously, you will put up with any indignity because your life depends on it. You will work a job you hate, do two hour commute each way. You will do all that because your life depends on it. This is not blaming you, it's just the system has if, on the other hand, you have access to, I mean, why would I go to the grocery store if, there, if, this, if the river's full of fish? You know, I wouldn't. But the system has inserted itself between us and the source of life. This happened with apartheid, and it was intentional. It was very, very interesting that the first laws of apartheid were really written to support the mines because they couldn't get anybody to work in the mines because everybody was in subsistence villages. And they didn't have cash. And they didn't, there's no reason for them to work in a mine. So what they did is one of the, some of the first rules were pull, pull taxes, hut taxes, dog taxes. So if you, have a, if you have a hut, you now have to pay a tax. And that means somebody's got to go to work. You've got to pay the tax in cash. And then the other part about this is that um, this is what abusers do typically in personal relationships too. One of the things they try to do is try to... to my father first beat my mother when she was pregnant with her first kid, and that's because she was committed. And he, back in the 50s, he controlled all the money. So when she had three kids, by the time she's 20, there's no way she could get out. And that's absolutely standard, and that's not accidental. Because if you can control somebody's access to food, you can control their life, and you can You've got them. And so it's the same 
so technology back to back to ted technology has been a boon for our ability to entertain ourselves no sorry that's completely wrong it's not been a boon for us to entertain ourselves it's a boon for us being entertained as opposed to entertaining ourselves which is what humans are supposed to do it's it's an outsourcing of all of this it's an outsourcing of music it's an outsourcing of of sports you know that there's no i watch football instead of play it or watch mm -hmm. football instead of watching younger people whom i know play it instead it's been and it's the same why would we sit around and sing together when we can listen to somebody who sings much better um on cd or on i guess that's old now i guess on hmm. on yeah. the internet and so it's been And that's not even to talk ecologically, you know, I mean, all of this stuff has an infrastructure. People talk about, oh, you know, the internet is this great, I mean, the internet requires tremendous energy, it requires tremendous physical infrastructure, and that all has to be built. And also, that all is built on land where somebody else already lived. So yeah, it's been a complete disaster. Yeah, I think, I think you've definitely spoken to the core of where this mind is coming from, where this, it's the disconnect from our bodies, the disconnect from reality, the disconnect from actually doing things and instead watching them or even watching someone. And now we've got, you know, people watch someone play a video game on TV. You know. I, I, I don't understand that. So I think, <laughs> I think, okay. I think you also playing... have people watching a video game watching someone play a video game watching someone else play a video game like there's a lot of levels this gets to <laughs> okay i find i find playing left for dead reasonably interesting mm -hmm. you know shooting zombies and i'm not actually shooting zombies in the game shooting zombies and i can't imagine watching somebody else play i would be so boring i would just unimaginably boring this is i would rather i would rather shoot myself than watch somebody else play it's i i don't yeah. <laughs> I, I have absolutely no idea what the... Nothing we're doing, even our own entertainment, is really for the material world and people around us anymore, from our work to, you know, the things we do to distract ourselves between our work. And yeah, I think it's depressed us as a population and we're looking every which way to get out of it, whether it be changing our gender, you know, uh, joining whatever sort of radical political ideology has come up that minute or moment that's entertaining. Hello. Thank you. <laughs> but I I think you've answered a lot of my questions and people's questions in general about this in this video, where that's coming from. And I suppose we do have to wrap up because everyone's attention spans are ruined, even the dogs. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I would ask, what would be your last message for people uh, watching this, your final message for a world of young people looking for purpose and meaning in one of so little but so many distractions? On one hand, I want to say, um, it's not your fault. I mean, the system itself is profoundly dysfunctional and it's not your fault. And it's not even personal that you feel discomfiture with the system. It's, we were not made for this. We were not, we didn't evolve to sit in front of screens all day and it's not who we are and there's so first off it's not your fault don't don't take it personally on the other hand it's your life so do take it personally because you you only get one life that we know of and when you look back at the end are you going to go that was kind of a drag. Um, I mean, you, you, I have made many mistakes in my life, but they've been my mistakes for the most part. And so recognize that you have one life and then recognize that you,
you know, I said this earlier, but, you know, what is it that, how can you contribute? How can you make it so the world, the real physical world is a better place because you were born and lived your life? How is it that you can, what is it you can do? And what, what, what gifts do you have that are unique to you and all the universe? It's, hmm. I used to, I used to be sad when I would see an old person working at Walmart, but I would never be sad if I saw an old farmer. And I couldn't figure out why for a few years. And then I realized, and this is nothing against the people who have to work at Walmart, but you're replaceable. And I would, nobody else in the universe could have written the books that I've written. And nobody else in the universe could do the work that you do and what is it that people can find that will be you know that what is it they can do that will make them happy and that will and that utilizes their gifts again i i write terrible terrible press releases and um i write i think really good books and i've been able to find that place where I can, and you know, I could, I could not, uh, I, I don't think I can be a musician. You know, I just, I don't have that. And there are people who can, mm -hmm. and I just, I marvel at that gift. And, um, you know, find the thing that, that you can do that both brings you joy, that A, is something you're gifted at. B brings you joy, and C helps helps the world. Can't really go wrong with that, but it's really hard work to find. You know that means that means you're going to have to go through. You're going to have to try a lot of things that you're just terrible at, and also, uh, you might have to give up other things for it. I think that's beautiful advice. And you said you're finally going to start making more YouTube videos. You promised me now. So can you tell people where they can find your content? <laughs> um, where can I? Deep Green Video, I think, is where all the Let old ones do. are. Yeah. Um, and I am going to start those up again someday. Uh, someday reasonably soon. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we got we did them for five or six or seven years, and I think it was once a week. So there's people have 350 of them to catch up on. Mm -hmm. and there then, we go. <laughs> that, and then once I'll, they catch up on those, you'll start the new ones. <laughs> yeah, I'll start new ones after that. <laughs> and then you've also got a new book you're working on. But uh, for some reason, A Language Before Words. That's, language Older Than Words. Yeah, that's the book that I've been reading. Very good. So do check out Derek Jensen's work. I'll put links down in the description for everyone. I'm sorry if you get harassed with emails that you find annoying but generally you guys are well behaved and kind and thoughtful so i really really appreciated this interview oh my goodness i feel like my brain is just overwhelmed but in a good way and i think we're gonna have to talk again because i look forward to many it. questions i still have to ask appreciate you all watching see you next time